Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the ghost of McCarthyism. People are still settling in. Thank you. So let me just uh, outline how we will proceed. I'll introduce myself and then I will uh, make some remarks for those of you who were born after Joseph McCarthy and may not be Americans and may not know who he is. And then I'll introduce our briefly august panel, uh, whom I'm going to refer to as the survivors and thrivers, you know, of academic and other kinds of hostility. So again, welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin McGurr. Oh, and I see Sri is with us. Welcome, Sri. Sri, are you yes. in the U.S. or are you in India? I'm in U.S. Okay, welcome. And you, uh, which time zone are you in? What time is it? It is. Uh, it's going to be six in the morning. I'm in uh, uh, Detroit. Uh huh. Okay, so you're up bright and early. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin McGurr. I am a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. For those of you who may not be aware or remember, it's the former home of that warm and fuzzy guy that we all know by the name of Stanton Glantz. So he and I are, are basically, um, we're not necessarily pals, but we are in the same academic institution. Uh, so let me say a couple of words about Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Senator McCarthy was a member of Congress, and he was elected to his seat uh, just a couple of years after World War II uh, in the U.S. Congress. And he emerged you know, at a time when we had a pause in the sort of anti-communist, anti-Marxist uh, hysteria that had begun to evolve you know, after the Russian Revolution. We had a pause, of course, because we were allies of the Soviet Union of Russia during the war. But once that was over and we began to emerge into what became known as the Cold War, uh, Mr. McCarthy was very successful in navigating and leveraging a growing antipathy and hostility and fear of communism in the US. And again, communism being an alternative idea, and again, separate perhaps from the government of the Soviet Union, but an alternative idea to what had very much become uh, a very significant investment, and I use that term literally and figuratively in the kind of capitalist free market system. And McCarthy was very successful in creating uh, and fomenting a lot of hysteria and fear around communism and communists being in various parts and in many different industries in the US. People may be aware uh, that he created that hysteria within the entertainment industry, uh, which became known as the blacklist of people who may potentially be members of the Communist Party not having their roles and, and thriving within their entertainment industry. That, of course, then migrated uh, with some significance into the academy, uh, where academics were basically muzzled, uh, excluded, uh, repressed, uh, lost academic positions, were prevented from academic positions simply because they were tainted with even the possibility of being connected with communism and Marxism. And of course, there were significant numbers of uh, inquiries and hearings that occurred you know, within universities where people oftentimes were asked to name names of you know, fellow travelers in the area of communism. Uh, and of course, Mr. McCarthy eventually lost favor because of his outrageous approach and techniques. And of course, you know, he, uh, the emergence of television, 
uh, in the early 50s were both his advantage but also his downfall, where Americans got to see both uh, you know, his fear tactics, you know, on full, uh, on full awareness, but also just how outrageous he was and eventually was censured by the U.S. Congress. I, again, before I introduce the panel, I want us to begin to uh, think about, and I, I think Mark Gunther's presentation very um, earlier this morning, and of course, um, Constantine Farsolinos' presentation yesterday is really a, a very great preview in terms of, you know, alternative ideas, you know, that we've been embracing, you know, in this room and at this conference now for some years, and that being in opposition, or maybe I should say in complement to the tobacco control industry. You know, the, the idea that there's another way of helping individuals change their smoking habit, that became and is still a very threatening idea to very invested in, in interest in tobacco control. And what has happened as a consequence, given that threat, and again, it's why I mentioned that uh, people here on our panel today are survivors and thrivers. They have experienced the hostility. They have experienced the harm. They have experienced perhaps the fear. But they fortunately, they've overcome you know, some of that or all of that hostility and have gone on and are now thriving in the work that they have done, you know, <clears throat> fomenting a new idea and a new approach about how we basically help particularly, you know, vulnerable pop populations in low and middle income countries and even very, very vulnerable populations in the high income countries like Europe and the US. So again, let me just turn this over. Uh, we have, uh, and again, please forgive me if I'm doing uh, damage to people's names, uh, we have Sri Sukarita, uh, who I mentioned is um, uh, in the U.S. today. Uh, she is a community uh, health uh, medicine professor uh, in a university in Chennai and has led a tobacco, I'm sorry, or I should say a harm reduction association, you know, within India. On my left is Brad Radu, and those of you who were here last evening uh, got to see uh, his award for the incredible work that he's done over the years and currently is a professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky, in which of course is nested in a lot of tobacco, farming, et cetera, et cetera. To my right is Derek Yak, who has a CV longer than I could ever imagine having. And of course, uh, Derek has done incredible work historically with the World Health Organization, and more recently has been the founding executive director of the, of the Foundation for the Smoke-Free World. And then on my right, and I'm not talking about politically, uh, is Marawe Glover, uh, who has done also some incredible work around advocacy as well as academic work having to do with particularly native populations, you know, down under. So we've got some incredible people who are here to tell their story of what they've had to contend with with respect to having alternative ideas and how they've thrived and continued. So let me start with Sri, would you like to lead us off and describe, um, by the way, I should also, uh, excuse me, uh, people have, uh, all of our panelists have uh, videos online which you can watch, and what they'll be doing is essentially providing uh, a brief summary of that video just to kind of get us beginning talking and dialoguing around some of this work having to do with uh, academic freedom. Shri, please uh, start us off. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity to be here, though not physically with all of you there. It's wonderful to see all of you and I can uh, recollect my past memories. The only time I was there after that uh, COVID happened and I could not come back again. Uh, 
this time I tried my best, but in spite of that, I could not get visa. Uh, so the video I have submitted, uh, if some of you have gone through, I have highlighted the academic environment uh, in the institution I worked with for almost 10 years. But the moment uh, in the past five to six years has been a little bit of a unique journey. Uh, I would say it's a little bit of unique journey because it was riddled with challenges and uh, uh, the challenges were uh, uh, more in, in the context of tobacco harm reduction because it was a novel concept for the panelists. Uh, when uh, my research later revealed that most of the Indian healthcare professionals are not aware of these alternative uh, solutions for addressing the tobacco epidemic, they are steeped in prevention or control. And in that control also, they are not much uh, practitioners of uh, nicotine replacement therapy. These are all the things which we came later to know because of our research. But initially, when I started with uh, tobacco harm reduction and proposed a uh, research application to the committee, that is when uh, the first time I have experienced this hurdle of uh, not having the freedom to explore a topic of research interest. That is the point of our topic today, academic freedom. As a researcher, we are just curious to understand what is the phenomenon happening in our society. Uh, and in a country with 300 million tobacco users, definitely it is of concern for us. And we want to see what, why the time-tested uh, mechanisms and strategies are not yielding the results or outcomes at public health or population scale. And when we have alternative solutions and people are already using some of these solutions, I just wanted in 2018 to explore who are these users of alternative uh, mechanisms and submitted a proposal when I wanted to go for the lung conference, World Lung Conference happening at that time in Hyderabad. Unfortunately, that was the time I experienced the first time and till now, the proposal has been suspended without given any ethics approval. So to start off with, uh, because uh, we will come back to it in during the discussions, the academic freedom, the researchers curiosity to explore a phenomenon of interest that should not be curbed because of the members assumptions or the institutional policies because the freedom to explore and to uh, elicit the determinants for such a phenomenon existing are taken up by the population it should be the uh, researcher's uh, prerogative or discretion. And the committee should not be in a position to tell us what kind of research we should undertake, what kind of uh, avenues we should explore. That is my contention. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I think I'll put it in context, and I hope everybody's seen the 10-minute video, but I'll put it in context. In 1994, and this is purely because of timing. Anybody who's ever published a paper knows you don't control the timing. But in 1994, I published three papers. The first one was pure mainstream. We published uh, the first ever study of nicotine levels in smokeless tobacco products by brand name. Nobody had ever tried doing it by brand name. I guess everybody was scared. We didn't know any better. We just go ahead, went ahead and put the brand names in and published nicotine levels. And we were trying to show that they had as much nicotine as any cigarette did. So it would serve as a source, as a basis for a switch. But it was mainstream never got a peep of controversy. The second paper is what I described in my 10 minute video. It was about my idea that smokers who couldn't, unable or unwilling to switch, or unwilling to quit tobacco entirely, switch to a smokeless tobacco product, which provided the nicotine. And that's what generated that whole 10 minute video that I went over. The third paper was a little bit back to mainstream. It was with Dr. Cole, and we talked about the life expectancy from American Cancer Society 
uh, of smokers compared with smokeless tobacco users based on what we knew of the risks at that time. Now, it was published in Nature, and that's a pretty good journal. And my other colleague, Don Miller, who I mentioned last night, he said at the time, Brad, you publish a, a, with a publication in Nature, that can make an academic career. That's what I thought he said, but what I didn't hear, I, I don't hear real well, I think what he actually said, that that can make an academic career miserable. <laughs> because that's what ended up happening that's described in that video. So I'll turn it over to the others with, the, with that final comment. Thank you, Brad. So let's uh, turn it over to Derek. Thanks, and I, I don't want to um, repeat my, my video. Um, I hope you'll not watch it, because I really look pretty bizarre, maybe as bizarre as I am here. But listen, um, I hope you'll get some ideas. What I, I thought I'd rather ask is an interesting question that I've asked um, my whole life. Um, where have I been freest to express my views and to carry out research? And uh, where have I been most constrained? And I'm not going to get into them. And um, the problem with my, my, my career is that I can't keep a job, and, um, which meant that I've been in the private sector, in the public sector, in a WHO agency, in a foundation, and God knows what. Um, and every time, I think one learns things. So if I had to answer the question of where I was freest I, I, I come to myself with strange answers. The first place was actually uh, way back in South Africa during the end of apartheid. Remember, it was the end of apartheid. South Africa was banned by WHO. Uh, South African academics were banned from international discourse, um, and uh, except with ANC permission. So when we wanted to travel, we had to get ANC permission out of London to go to a conference. But within the institution, Epidemiology and biostatistics were seen as truly important to open freedom about expressing differences between groups by race, by class, by geography. And never did I feel any effort to censure or to control or to stop the publication or the work as long as the intent was to have data that could improve health. This is in an apartheid medical research council. And for me, the sort of epitome of the surprise, even to me at the time, was when the townships were burning in the late 1980s. And I went to the then conservative president of the medical research council and I said, we need to document the impact of police violence in the township on health and health services. His answer was, tell me how much it costs and we will not go through the normal process. You'll have it tomorrow because it was important to do. And the publication eventually came out in the American Journal of Public Health. What thought me was that the outside world may have seen at the time a view of South Africa that was not reflected by the internal uh, desire of an institution that remained true to the ethics and cause. The second was, um, again, surprising, was at PepsiCo, where our good friend Stan Glantz claimed I started my transition to the dark side. And what a glorious transition to the dark side it was. Um, Indra Nui was my boss, essentially, and I was an early hire. And I'll never forget the first meeting when the president of the International Union of Nutrition Scientists came to meet with her and me and said, on behalf of international nutrition scientists, we want to express our concern uh, that you're taking somebody out of public health and uh, you're going to use that person to distort data and results. And our answer to him was, if he does anything but not continue what he was doing with you, he's of zero value to this institution and will be out of here before he knows it. And I mention that because that's the way it played out. And anybody who's been inside the last R&D facility of a corporation would maybe be surprised. I learned not to be surprised that the openness there is actually greater than I saw inside the hallowed halls of academia. The discourse was very real. You had to get it right. Because if you got it wrong, the company would lose profits and go under. So you better get it right. There was a double motivation of getting it right for science, and science was usually going to have to be aligned with better products. 
And that's, of course, the start of my second transition. And the third one was when I completed my transition to the dark side. And those early discussions with the then CEO of PMI were about the most open, most interesting discussions I've had about tobacco control that I thought I'd ever have. Um, it was with somebody who was deeply knowledgeable, and we knew only a fraction of what they knew about what truly worked, the role of taxes and everything else. But it boiled down to taking the stuff that mattered, the stuff that was killing you, out of the core product. And those discussions, which went on for several months, led me through the laboratories to meet some of the scientists from the pharmaceutical industry, asking them, what on earth are you doing here? And they said, we're promoting health. The pharma Many of them came out of frustration that the pharmaceutical industry hadn't got on with that very same job that the tobacco industry is now left to do, is to recognize the role of nicotine and separate it from the stuff that was killing you. On that, um, I obviously completed my transition to the dark side. And um, when I looked back now, seven years later, what have been the results? Well, we now know that same company is now getting 31, 32% of revenue from reduced risk products. It was zero at the time. Uh, the FDA has ruled that this is appropriate for the protection of public health, where at the time there was no regulatory belief that this had any particular benefit to public health. And so I feel vindicated. If I was just to go one, one minute more and say, so where did I feel, feel most restrained? And I won't go into details, and I, you know, maybe you'll ask in, in question time, but it was in places I shouldn't have been most restrained. WHO was not a particularly open environment for the discourse on science. And remember, I wasn't just in tobacco. I was in tobacco, non-communicable diseases, mental health, violence, and many other areas of public health where there were certain topics which were simply taboo for the institution and still are today. There were certain discussions about countries and um, political reality that couldn't be brought up. So I think one needs to often question oneself about where are you freest? to actually express your views and what happens to that freedom. Let me just end off by saying um, there's a wonderful piece that I hope people look at in the American Journal of Public Health, and I hope the activists in the audience read it and respond to the American Journal of Public Health. The title starts off very promisingly aligned with this session. Harassment of health officials, a significant threat to public health. That sounds great. And then you read uh, somewhere down here, controversy in public health is not new and isolated experiences of harassment are, are common. Before COVID, health officials faced opposition from members of the public for supporting efforts to ban youth vaping and the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. So they were saying that it was the harassment um, by those trying to promote e-cigarettes, which was a big threat to health officials, ignoring, of course, the entire session that Mark outlined earlier, showing where the true harassment came from. And the fact that this can appear in the American Journal of Public Health is particularly ironic, since they've just banned Brad and I from publishing a response they requested um, on issues related to what the FDA now needs to do to address e-cigarettes. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Certainly a lot to think about. Uh, Marobe, you're on. Okay, good morning and thank you for flying with us. I know that you have a choice of airlines. <laughs> and we're great, it's great to see so many people here. So um, my video, uh, you know, it's quite hard to talk about the attacks and uh, not get emotional and, you know, dredge it all up. So I took a more analytical, um, you know, push it out and be, be the scientist and look objectively at it. I did some analysis of it. And, and just as a little bit of background, uh, I, at a master's level, so I, all my training was in psychology and then community psychology. Community psychology tends to look at, um, you know, we look at community development, the process of policy analysis, advocacy, and also just facilitating, you know, not-for-profits or community groups. So that's what I trained in. And before going into policy analysis and public health and finding, you know, well, where can I spend my time to most use? Obviously, work on the uh, thing that was killing the most, uh, well, the biggest killer of Māori people, the Indigenous people of New Zealand. So that led me to work on tobacco, and I've been doing that for 30 years. Um, and, 
We are making progress, and I certainly um, know that I've had a lot to do with that. But, you know, I think when you make progress and there's some reward at the end of it, or certainly awards uh, and recognition, it, and then also we had to lobby a lot for extra funding, for tobacco control, uh, and it kind of opened up a wild, wild west situation, or more like the gold rush, uh, and uh, my head of department and PhD supervisor who was in the gambling area talked about this model of the gold rush, the wild, wild west. And when you have a gold rush, um, so if you think of the wild, wild west, there are medicine men and there are gold diggers. And so there were the, kind of the three Gs. And I saw it happen starting from being the first full-time uh, indigenous person working on tobacco in New Zealand. And, and then that frontier opened up and there was money, and the three Gs are sort of gold, glory, and girls. Um, and, and that's what it kind of became like. A lot of people rush in for the three Gs, and it, get, and it became very competitive, and it's like rats in a box, you know, uh, a lot of competition over the funding. And, and then the more people that are there and the more people that sort of figure out how are they going to become the expert, and you, it's quite cutthroat. Academic has, academia's got quite cutthroat, as there has been an increasing number of people coming through universities, getting degrees, getting PhDs, seeking research funding, and there just isn't, the, the funding doesn't grow, that funding pool. So. Uh, I actually, and um, Steve, my partner, always said it's always about the money. I'm like, no, it's not. I know these people. Uh, but I, I think I have come round to it is about money. And, uh, and so that's what I talk about. This campaign against me started a long time before, uh, you know, Derek suggested, why don't you think about... <laughs> a centre focused on Indigenous people globally. I mean, I never could have imagined that I ever would have got to work at a global level focusing on reducing the harms of tobacco use for Indigenous people worldwide. Uh, what an amazing opportunity. And certainly, you know, we did our due diligence and we thought about it a lot. We thought about the flack that would come, but there's a higher kind of goal, you know, if you're spiritual or you, you believe in God or, or whatever. At, at the end of the day, uh, you have to do what you can to, to improve the world, especially for your people. And the opportunity was too great. I either remained um, cut out of tobacco control as I already was. They had already got rid of me out of the university where I had kept a job for 15 years, and I had been very successful getting research funding, millions of dollars of research funding, researcher initiated. If I hadn't won that funding, I wouldn't have had a job. And I'd built a center up. Um, I had 11 staff. I had won a government uh, contract to roll out one of my interventions, a national uh, stop smoking competition. And, you know, so, and then a colleague and I won an innovative um, research grant where we would be holding the budget and we would get to dish out, you know, have funding rounds. So it was a real innov innovative trial of could we fund researchers in a different way? The Ministry of Health and Health Research Council it was a joint venture. They wanted to bring all of the leaders in tobacco control in New Zealand together to work together, bring the greatest minds together to, to be on this, um, this fund together. And I was one of those uh, leading minds. Well, the, another university, uh, they wanted to win that and they refused to work with me. Uh, they they saw my colleague as the softer touch. They'd be able to get him over to their side. And thankfully to him, he stood by me uh, and you know, didn't give in. So we did win it. And boy, did they hate that. And so that was a five-year uh, program of money, $5 million, so very significant in New Zealand. And somewhere along the line, you know, it just continued the undermining and eventually uh, 
they, they got rid of me out of the university using whatever means possible, complaints, um, you know, manufacturing. Uh, anyway, it's in my talk. Please have a look. So uh, I was offered a chance to go to another university uh, because another professor did not like what he was seeing, so that was great, and then promoted uh, and up to professor. I mean, I didn't even think I would even become a professor. Uh, so that was fantastic, but I was out of tobacco control. If you want to get research funding in New Zealand, you are judged by a panel of your peers. Well, they were not um, my peers anymore. <laughs> and so that was it. And it was kind of like, well, you do 25 years ex uh, you know, developing your expertise in a topic, and then they've just cut me out. Um, so I began working on obesity and other topics and teaching. And so when Derek and others formed the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World and this opportunity came up, how could I say no? Uh, I might be able to do some good again using my expertise. And it's a topic I love and, uh, and it's a work of love you know, for the people who are being harmed and who are being left out and left behind. So I did that, and yes, <laughs> the flat came. Uh, really surprising how vicious, how violent it has been. Obviously, nobody's actually punched me in the face. I would actually prefer that. I've got, I've got a lot of experience being beaten up and uh, bad childhood, so yeah, come punch me in the face. Don't do all of this, you know, highfalutin, backstabbing and what they do, which I talk about in the video. When I did my masters, I actually wanted to work on domestic violence and the reduction of sexual abuse. Um, I'm already a survivor of that. So, you know, if you've been through worse abuse, then I think that has helped me get through this. Um, and I am a fighter and a survivor. So I wanted to work on that, but that was kind of really heavy. <laughs> but I did learn about violence, and I began to see the same pattern. Um, some of you may be aware of the Duluth model. Uh, from Duluth, there's a Duluth model, the power and control wheel. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. And when I was asked to put together a presentation um, about the experiences, about these strategies, I could see the same kind of model. There was a chronological strategy, and my uh, master's thesis was on male partner violence against indigenous women. And one of the first things that men do is isolate the partner. So they will move to another town, they will separate her from her friends. So the isolation is one of the first steps in domestic violence, and it's also what uh, these public health uh, competitors do. So isolation is the first one. Demean, belittle, put down, destroy your self-confidence um, and make you doubt yourself, gaslighting, all sorts of things to destroy your, uh, you know, your mental health. So that's the next strategy, is that kind of emotional abuse. The sabotage in terms of academia is rife, um, but you know, anything they can do to sabotage your work, to sabotage your chance of getting f uh, funded, published, uh, to be, speak at conferences. Um, and then the fourth um, theme or category was erasure to erase the person altogether. Now that is, um, this is a very long-standing strategy in academic, academic bullying, uh, and there's a phenomenon called mobbing. And there are many books on it, and I've read it having been through that before joining the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, um, and I mentioned one of those in the video. One of uh, the books was called well, I always remember it as getting rid of that pain in the ass professor. And he kind of wrote the book in a tongue-in-cheek way. It's like a manual for how to get rid of a professor. And this whole thing of erasure, the first thing, really, the best thing, 
that they try to do is get you to commit suicide. And this is a very heavy issue. There have been over 400 suicides of academics, of professors around the world. Um, and so it's not an uncommon, it, I guess it is uncommon, uh, but it, it happens. So I was, um, yeah, that's kind of very scary. I knew that I had to look after my mental health and, and survive this because that's, that's the easiest thing if you want to get rid of someone, uh, drive them to suicide. If they don't leave uh, or kill themselves, then you start implementing all of these other strategies. So please have a look at the video. It's not all sob sob, you know, poor me. It's more an analytical kind of push it out a little bit, make it easier to, for me to talk about and maybe for you to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, pose a question to the panel. I mean, given that you are here and you have survived and you've thrived, uh, I know that you're all aware <clears throat> of younger people who are trying to break into the research world, perhaps trying to break into tobacco uh, research. And I've had many people who've said, I will not partner with you, I'm afraid, particularly in the context where I have been the belly of the beast. What do you say to young people? How is it that you basically pushed on through? How do we advise individuals to stick with their beliefs, with their intentions, and overcome the hostility that they may be experiencing? Well, I, f I first want to um, uh, c uh, commend um, uh, Jerry and Paddy and uh, the group for the Kevin Malloy scholarships, which are doing just that. And um, the three winners uh, last night, I think, epitomize what is certainly beyond my answer. Why are they doing what they're doing? And they're doing it because they have a passion to address the public health consequences of smoking. And they see that as a more powerful motivating force th for their careers than the potential harassment that they may face along the way. And I think that is always going to be the most powerful motivation for them. On the downside, I do worry, of course, that um, there are a growing group of young people, young faculty, uh, young people in masters and doctoral level who, are, who feel that they are harassed out of their careers. Um, I think it was uh, Donna Carroll uh, from University of Minnesota and, and a bunch of uh, young people who wrote a piece in one of the journals a couple of months ago, spelling exactly out this problem, that their career prospects <laughs> they were fearful of were being hampered if they continued in tobacco harm reduction in general, regardless of the source of the funding. And of course, that has a very chilling effect. My answer to them again is, as uh, the scholars will say, you've got to go where, uh, the, the, in my case, I've always in public health believed I go where the biggest public health gains are possible regardless of what the consequences of taking them on are. For some people, that's a motivation. That's not the only motivation people will have. It could be curiosity. This is a field where science, technology, is getting very exciting. The merger of digital, biotechnology, behavioral sciences, intellectually, this is a, an area of great endeavor. And the transformation of bad into good, in the case of nicotine, is coming faster than we suspected as we start looking at the aging brain. So there are many reasons and motivations for people, people to do it, and it will be up to them to decide what motivates them. You were talking about how to push through, yeah, and what to say to young people. So um, I obviously like harm reduction. You have to start where people are at, and everybody has their own circumstances. So. I understand why many people have completely cut me off and they're not allowed to talk to me. They're not allowed to read my work. And, you know, where once we were, I, you know, sort of friends, I thought, uh, but at least friendly colleagues. And, you know, they haven't talked to me for a couple of years now. now and I understand that they need to do what they need to do to feed their families. And, and for their career. Um, certainly, it's, it's a struggle, you know, you th mm, thought we were friends, well, 
in my book, a friend wouldn't do that. So, okay, we were just colleagues. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, I understand people have to do what they've got to do. And young people particularly are probably going to be forgiven because they didn't know, you know, how could they know at the start of their career or something like that. So I think that young people will, they won't have that same, uh, if, you know, um, erasure or, you no, know, you're complete, you'll never have a career in academia. But I have seen some leaving, you know, they've done their PhD on harm reduction and they've gone to other fields and that is a loss for us. So it is important that we put time into developing up and coming and emerging researchers, but I, I'm kind of careful to offer that given that I know what's, you know, what they potentially are going to uh, be met with. And the other thing is that I front this. If anyone's got anything to say, you hit me, you know, you not, you're not to hit any of my staff or anyone that works for me. So I front everything. And in, in, in academia, I guess, that could be seen to be, oh, you know, she wants her name on, she wants all the glory and the gold and obviously, you know, we don't talk about the girls. And, um, but, but it's not, it's about protecting everybody else that's involved. I made the decision and I, you know, it should, the buck should stop at the top and the bombs can be chucked there as well. Shri, uh, Shri did you have uh, comments, please? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a very important question because uh, from my own experience, uh, after uh, some time, it, it starts taking a toll on you because the academia, uh, at least in India, I, I'm, I'm sure it is different in different parts of the world, but in India, because of lack of uh, a very good awareness about the potential of this alternative uh, avenues and harm reduction, similar to drug narcotics, it has not been taken up uh, drug harm reduction is widely accepted in India, whereas tobacco harm reduction has not made equal uh, attention at the policy level or even in academia. So in that kind of environment, if someone is choosing to work exclusively on tobacco harm reduction or a major chunk of their research being uh, tobacco harm reduction, like me, for the past six years, I have faced a lot of a lot of uh, hostility and a lot of challenges, repeated appearances in committees and all that. After some time, it takes a toll on you. And it, as uh, Professor Mareva alluded, the first point is isolation. And there is a kind of uh, halo around you that you are doing some kind of unmerited or demerited research because it's not widely accepted the topic why 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 some why not something else kind of uh, halo surrounds you so in my experience i after all this uh, 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 journey i am stepping out of academia because it's high time to pursue freely you need your own avenue so and we are not beginners so we, at least my career is 15 years. Uh, my Professor Marevas is 30 years. But for someone coming into this field, as uh, uh, again, Dr. Derek has mentioned, uh, there, is, there is a price you have to pay to pursue certain career options and what are your motivations. But still at this level, a global conference like this, when a question is posed like that, we know the problem that youngsters who are going to pursue or even established uh, academicians like us are facing. Can we think of a solution and uh, propose a support network where all of us, if even we can be just, you know, a sounding board when someone expresses because uh, Professor Mareva again mentioned mental health, especially for women scholars, because we are more sensitive to these issues because there is, there is gender component here so maybe at this global forum, I would suggest maybe we have to propose a support network for at global level for any academic uh, scholars or anyone facing some kind of disturbances in their pathways related to research or career. Maybe we can have a forum at least to express and seek out mentoring solutions or some kind of support that will help help a lot of people to continue keep up their aspirations and 
uh, get some solidarity and you know keep moving forward because we did not give up we are just stepping out from a hostile environment to pursue it freely so alternative channels can be opened up thank you i i really like the idea of beginning to foster you know a supportive network globally and perhaps this conference you know serves that purpose why don't we uh, open this up now to Oh, right, please go ahead. Thank, thank you. Um, I, mine will be brief. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I ran a clinical trial, Skull Bandits, and, as a smoking cessation method back in the mid-90s. And I had a resident in oral pathology. I was in charge of a residency program, and he didn't have any other choice. He had to work with us. Uh, that's the good thing about residency programs is your residents have to kind of follow the rules. But he got first author on our publication in the American Journal of Medicine, so he was rewarded. Since then, fortunately, I haven't had to answer that question because no students have ever wanted to work with me. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Uh, Questions from the audience, questions um, from the virtual audience, please um, let us know what you're, you're thinking, your comments, your reactions. Please. Uh, Yoni Jafir from New Zealand. Uh, very, sorry, very similar question um, to the students and emerging researchers. What one piece of advice would you give them to help them protect themselves? You know, again, I think it's something I, I think about a lot. And for me, the most important thing is to have a, a mentor over the long term. And that's why um, I, I really think uh, the last comment of Sri's is so important. I, I think this, this conference really could think deeply about how do you actually create that mentorship system, which in the end must have a lead mentor, but then have that um, uh, group that you could actually phone into and know you'll have a trusted person who's been there and understands uh, where you're at. Um, and th there need to be people who really have a, a depth of understanding and a re relatively long experience. So just to reiterate, I think uh, Sri's suggestion mustn't go unpassed. I, I really think there's something there that we should build on and uh, think about how you can put into effect. I think that one of the ways to protect yourself is really to strive for excellence in your scientific work. So, you know, developing your skill and your writing skill, your, your research abilities. I mean, if you write an excellent paper, you should be able to get it published somewhere. The, the whole publishing realm is, is pretty corrupt, really. But, um, and, and it's even more corrupt now that, uh, you know, we've formed a list, some of the grantees. We have a list of all of these publications that refuse to publish our work because we are funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And, uh, you know, so I started looking like, how come we can't get published? And yet, industry, tobacco industry scientists are getting published. I mean, they might not feel that they're getting published all the time, but they are compared to, to us. And I started looking, well, where are they getting published? OK, well, I'll submit there. Uh, clearly, they don't have the same policy. So there are many journals uh, that are not, that have not been corrupted by the uh, you know, the tobacco control, people leading this attack. And um, you just have to, and again, we must communicate, so we share that information among ourselves. Where are we getting published? Uh, where are there still open doors? And, and the other thing we need in terms of support, well, I really think that's an important um, suggestion of Shri's as well. And we do need a better support network, maybe more frequent communication around this, because one of the other things that this blacklisting and uh, that is included in this McCarthyite type strategy is that they will not review any of our papers 
Um, I remember when I was deep in tobacco control, um, you did not review any paper written by a tobacco company scientist. That was a rule. And now that's been extended to people uh, funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And, you know, so we need also a list of people who are willing to... Uh, be more robust scientifically and review a paper regardless of the funding. You, Of course you're going to look for bias and evidence of, of a conflict, but really is there good science there? I would say strive for excellence and we definitely need more frequent communication and sharing of information and we need others outside of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World grantees in academia who have published, who are willing to review. And please let me know if any of you are, because I'm tobacco section editor of the Harm Reduction Journal and struggle to find people to review for us. Thank you. I, please, over, over here. Hi, it's John Summers from the UK. Um, when I studied um, science, I, I was always, you know, brought up to um, to engage in debate. You know, you 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 can agree to disagree. But one thing that I've, I, I, I'm increasingly seeing across all of academia is this notion of deplatforming, of of dehumanising people. And do we think maybe that, that you know this is something that's happening generically across academia, that there's an, a hyper-politicization of students and of, of study of, of academia itself that needs to be fought? Um, I, yes, the answer is yes. Um, I, I've been tracking particularly, um, I think, which is a growing deep concern, that it, it's coming, any contrarian view uh, now has a difficult time having an open, respectful debate in the traditional uh, spirit of academic openness and discourse. We're going against the UNESCO codes of conduct on uh, open science. And I think people really need to be reminded of what UNESCO says constitutes open science and open dialogue. Um, it says that nothing should be banned on the basis of anything except the underlying methods of the science, not the source of the funding. Of course, the source of the funding must be fully and completely uh, explained and outlined in great detail, but that shouldn't be a criteria to remove it. I think the bigger concern is that I see is the schism between um, the private sector and the public sector and private funding and public funding. Not, forget the tobacco sector. I think the last of the latest combat of developments we're seeing out of WHO are going to make this substantially worse. The creation of a commercial, uh, a unit called a unit on the commercial determinants of health, I think represents a chilling effect to anybody with any industry interests. So the thesis of this unit is basically that profit-making entities are bad and should be regulated and taxed, regardless of what they do, pharma, food, tobacco, alcohol, whatever it is. And they lump them all together, and you can read that. Um, the assumption is that they are always bad. Um, many of us uh, would not be alive today if we didn't have Pfizer and Moderna doing their great science, um, some of them not getting any government funding, using their own basic science to do it, the others producing vaccines um, take the PMI investment in a vaccine, which people don't want to take because it's going to come from with some tobacco money. Well, that's insanity. And we should be actually having people call it out in those terms. It's just totally unacceptable. But the same is happening in the food sector. Uh, food scientists are being uh, dizzed if they are supporting efforts to lower salt or sugar or trans fats or to promote healthy food because the source of the funding is the food sector. And the creation of this commercial determinants of health in my mind, is a throwback to the 1980s in the UK when there was a very heavy-handed approach to try and dismiss or make sure that the okay. private sector innovation you know, it's not and entrepreneurial of spirit didn't emerge. You created created pretty like certain that. you didn't get it all. He couldn't actually era, say that this possibly WHO wasn't. Digital space are soaring and are probably going to be the key to our most complex problems we face, everything from climate change to feeding the world to improving health. We should be encouraging and embracing that nexus between 
entrepreneurship, the private sector spirit, innovation, technology, and many universities are actually grabbing that and seeing that when you put that nexus together, we're actually gonna have breakthrough innovations to benefit the world. At that time, it's difficult to comprehend that WHO and many of the thought leaders there are going in exactly the opposite direction. And that will have exactly the effect that you are worried about. Could I just add? Um, you know, what happened during COVID-19 and the scientists that tried to speak out about some of the things that were said early on with a lack of evidence. And, you know, so leading medical scientists uh, began to speak out. And, and I saw the same strategies being used against them. And a part of me was like, good, this, this is going to a lot more people in a different sector uh, leading, you know, medical scientists are beginning to experience some of these same strategies Maybe now, uh, because, you know, just what happens to us in tobacco control and because of the existence of the tobacco industry, there's not a lot of sympathy for us. But what, when, what about when these strategies happen to others in the medical profession who start questioning the modelling on, you know, how many people will die from COVID and, and all of the arguments around the infectiousness and the, everything that they began to challenge and critique, and then they start uh, being blacklisted and defamed. And, and I, I kind of hoped that that will create a more of a backlash against this academic mobbing and or bullying. Um, yet to see it happen, uh, maybe when we get through uh, a little bit more, there, there will be, I think that they will start to say, and we do have as well, because it's all within the political um, you know, context as well, there's a lot around free speech, um, and a lot more backbite on that, on free speech. So some of this links in there. It's definitely happening in other sectors. Um, I think there was a scientist in South Africa, lo a low-carb, healthy fat scientist, that they were deregistered and had to take it to court. So it is happening in other sectors, and I think it's about this whole isolating us thing keeping us isolated if scientists across sectors got together to talk about these strategies and to start to, uh, and more research was done on how this was being used uh, across academia. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add uh, two comments to uh, what people have been saying. Uh, building on the idea of you know supporting younger people, I think us, older types, at least I guess I can refer to myself that way, uh, we do have the longer view historically. And I, as a person who had been involved with harm reduction since the early 90s, I've seen in the US how we've come from incredible hostility and rigidity around abstinence as being the way to basically help people around drug use but it's taken in the US amongst government funders now over 30 years to actually use the words harm reduction. So there is hope, uh, change does occur. But again, the other piece I think I wanna add to that is remember in the US and in Europe, harm reduction began not from the top, but it began from the bottom. Street health workers, street outreach workers went out and delivered clean needles to individuals, to vulnerable populations. It did not come from the public health professionals. It didn't come from the pharmaceutical industry. It didn't come from politicians. People had to take risks. And so that's important as well, that people have to understand that if you're going to do the work, that it's also going to require some level of risk. And I think that ultimately you can and will be rewarded. The other piece that I want to respond to Eric, uh, Derek talking about calling out, the other piece that I've sometimes gotten very frustrated with in the US, particularly 
and unfortunately from some harm reduction circles is that because of the historical damage that has been done by the tobacco industry, uh, they, have, they are succeeding oftentimes in creating this argument that being anti-tobacco harm reduction is a social justice issue. When from my perspective, the, ir the irony is by denying access to individuals, to vulnerable populations, and I really appreciated what Mark Gunther was saying earlier, that it's a class and economic issue. In the US, it is poor people, people with mental illness, people with substance use issues. They are the individuals who are still smoking. They're the individuals who need the most help and the greatest access to any product that's going to help them change or quit smoking entirely. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, that leads to this, this question, I think, of the importance of tobacco harm reduction for really working far more closely and thinking of joint opportunities with the broader harm reduction community. I think that represents a very important way forward to actually have a fresh language as well about what that means because there's virtually no area of public health where progress is being made where we aren't dependent on harm reduction strategies. The entire COVID campaigns um, are based on many aspects of the harm reduction. We know the HIV AIDS uh, issues. Um, you mentioned needle exchanges. I'm always reminded um, uh, of long discussions with Thomas Zeltner, who was the chair of the WHO board and is currently the president of the WHO Foundation who tells the story of when he was uh, heading the Swiss Public Health uh, Department and launched the needle exchange program in Zurich and the incredible hostility and abuse that he got, uh, particularly from the mothers and, and women of uh, Zurich and German-speaking um, uh, Switzerland at the time, that he actually had to have security protection. Um, and when you, and then, when you hear that, you wonder, well, if that's a known experience, and I was at WHO at the end of the period, and our job was to evaluate the impact of the programs through the mental health and substance abuse programs. And of course, they showed enormous success. Why did that not cross over into an understanding in our field? Uh, why have we not yet been able to bridge that divide? I think part of it is that we're not meeting enough and talking enough about having a decent common language to actually say there's nothing peculiar about tobacco harm reduction. It's normal public health policy in anything where there isn't a black-white solution, which is basically anything related to behavior. You think of a single behavior that we want to bring about in terms of changes from a desirable health point of view, and it will always be along a spectrum of least risky to most risky, and our job in public health, I've always felt, is to provide people with the choice, the tools, and the supportive environment to move ideally along the path to lower risk. Um, and um, I think that's what tobacco harm reduction and all harm reduction does. Um, Question over here. Can I just jump okay. in again? Sorry. I wanted to say that um, in terms of meeting, you know, when I get down, uh, and I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful for the funding from the Foundation f for, s for a Smoke Free World, and one of our projects is a longitudinal study with people who smoke, who don't believe that they will be able to quit and or they don't want to quit. And so we're following these people through, we're doing in-depth qualitative studies with them. I listen to every single uh, recorded interview and we're writing up the stories, uh, the case stories, and it's all on the website for everybody else to see as well. And it's part of that excellence and research and transparency. So when I when I do start to feel sort of a bit down and and you know there's been another attack, I listen to the interviews, and it really grounds me in why I'm doing, why we are doing this work. So it's that importance. And you talked earlier before about. You know, you're working with the people that we are working for. I work for you, the people who vape. I work for the people who smoke. I don't work for tobacco control. I don't work for a university. I don't work for the foundation. And, and it's, so it's about staying in touch 
and listening to them, there's struggles, the context of why they smoke, why they vape, the injustices that they suffer, the marginalization that they suffer, and that drives me and that you know keeps me going. The other thing that has kept me going is the community of people who vape. The vapors in the world, on Twitter, um, on their, uh, what, what's it called, the video shows, the radio shows that they have, and, and interviewing me. Um, so when nobody else wants to hear about my research results, they do, and they share that among themselves. So, you know, your vaping associations are so important to keeping me going, and thank you. Thank you. Important. Helen, I think you had a comment. <clears throat> Actually, Kevin, something you said made me think of, um, I just wanted to share what happened to me recently because what's happening on, on your level, it's actually happening on another level in terms of uh, bullying and being blacklisted. And I'm a, a social worker, and for years I've done tobacco harm reduction vaping groups with people who use drugs, people with mental health issues, people who are homeless. The exact group of people that we need to bring vaping products to. And for a couple years I w was doing these groups at a, a social service agency in New York City, and they were great. Uh, waiting list to get into the group, and really having lots of uh, conversations with people at this agency, breaking down the myths and the lies around vaping, because the junk science is so powerful. So COVID hits, all the groups have to stop. Once the agency was back up and running, I went back to them and I said, I want to start these groups up again. They were like, great, let's get it going. Uh, so I, I got everything into place. And I have a relationship with Juul. I know people who work there, I love their products. And they offered me a $5,000 grant to do this group, just to provide food and other things. I did not want to use Juul. We had another product that we would be giving to people for free. So I asked the agency, I said, I know this could be tricky. Do you want to accept this money or not? They said they would accept the money all ready to do the group. A week before the group start, was about to start, I get an email and then a phone call. We're canceling the group, you can't do it, well why? And she wouldn't really come out and say, but it was because of Jewel. And uh, this conversation was terrible. She was saying all of the, the junk science that um, they don't work, you just want people to buy a particular product so that you can make these companies rich. And I was just, absolutely blown away. So now I am tainted because of guilt by association, essentially, because I offered this agency a grant from Juul. So this is how it can play out and shut things down. I mean, I was, and one of my arguments was to her, Kevin, you just mentioned it, was this is about health justice, this is about racial justice. The people who come to this particular agency to get uh, sterile syringes, it's an overdose prevention site. You're doing harm reduction, this is tobacco harm reduction, this is reducing the harms of tobacco. These products, this is what, this is, should be part of this harm reduction family of products. I could not move her. Then I said, I want to come to your agency and do a presentation and let's have it out, right? Come at me, I'm ready for it. Never happened. So if you're trying to do this work on another level, just bringing products to the groups that need it, you might face some blowback, guilt by association, et cetera. And it means that the people who need these products the most are not gonna get them until we can break through. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, except to say I made a huge mistake by even trying to get a Juul grant. Like I'm thinking I never should have done that. So maybe that's the lesson here. A lot more work to be done. We have uh, time for one more question. Uh, the gentleman in the back, I believe it was. Yeah, my name is Christoph. I'm from PMI, Germany. And for the past six months, I had the opportunity to work together and collaborate with a very reputable university in, in Germany. And these are very bright uh, five and six semester bachelor students. 
and uh, we had the opportunity to provide a challenge for the students so that they can work on, and this is in the area of harm reduction. And um, the students are completely free in how to tackle the challenge, and they decided to, to, to tackle the challenge with um, making qualitative interviews with certain people that are in the area of regulation, tobacco regulation, and so on and so forth. So they contacted professors throughout Germany, and what they experienced it was that um, they were shunned out, so they, weren't, uh, they, they couldn't initiate a conversation with those people. And I think this was a very hard experience for those very young and bright minds that were just trying to solve an academic problem that we provided. And uh, the solution I presented them until now was um, make this part of your thesis. So um, talk about that because it's a very new experience for, for this academic area that um, your thoughts are not open. They are not openly uh, discussed and uh, maybe you have an additional comment how um, they get the answers they, they are looking for because they, they want to write about science. Yeah, they don't want to write about how they are not able to initiate a conversation, right? So maybe you have a comment on that. Thank you, well that's, that's hopeful. Uh, we have one last comment from this young lady up here and then hers will be the last. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Wheeler, I do a lot of sort of political small business advocacy in the United States. And, um, you know, one, one thing that we worked very hard on this year was the flavor ban in Colorado. And, um, you know, it's something they've been pushing there for a long time. And the campaign for tobacco free kids, they bring in hordes and hordes of scientists and people from academia that, that talk at length just blatant lies, things that are not backed up by anything factual. You know, um, we had um, worked very hard this year. Uh, to bring in some PhDs and some harm reduction experts to talk about that and you know first of all it was a very hard thing to do we had to ask um, you know dozens and dozens and dozens of people just to get you know a small handful uh, that were able to come do it and you know one, one thing is you know I would be interested to hear uh, what the obstacles are to weighing in in, in policy hearings and, and debates on legislation um, but it was really interesting because uh, we had one person there who um, was talking about, you know, why a flavor ban would, would be, you know, a bad idea. And uh, Stanton Glantz popped up, you know, to talk about why what this person was saying wasn't, you know, credible, you know, which is very ironic because this is a person uh, th that has never had their research retracted being criticized by someone who is the king of, of junk science, right? Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, when, when we had those people that were willing to, to show up and, and talk about those things, it really resonated with a lot of the lawmakers because they were able to see it wasn't just those of us who own small businesses or, you know, those of us who use these products saying these things, but there's actual, you know, research and science and data behind it because so often, you know, there are a hundred scientists just spouting lies and it's a very unbalanced conversation. And so I guess I would be curious as, you know, what are the obstacles to, to getting more involved in, in, in policy discussions and, and when things are being voted on? Anyone want to respond to? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I front up to those. You have to be very strong. Um, you know, you present, they sit in the background scoffing and blah, 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 you know. Um, and then immediately after I've spoken, the next speaker will defame me, go on radio, defame me. Uh, the MPs themselves will also, um, you know, you can't rely on them to be professional. So you have to be strong and... Uh, but somebody, you know, somebody's got to do it. And the thing is that we are on the side of right. And I think as time has gone on since my first GFN 2015, uh, you know, there is more and more evidence that we are on the side of right. And with Stanton Glantz, I mean, he's a funny little man, really, but he's actually very easy to undermine. So if you are ever in the room with him, um, he hates to be challenged. He will quickly lose his temper and show just how abusive he is, what an abusive little man he is. And in a meeting, and, I'm, and we, it came up about e-cigarettes, and this was... Uh, he visited New Zealand, and 
he wasn't even coming to talk about e-cigarettes, just the anti-vaping, anyone that they could bring. They say, could you please talk about e-cigarettes? Oh, I didn't really come to talk about that. But anyway, they want people to say negative things about it. So um, it was a small private conversation with a few of us, and he started talking about e-cigarettes. I said, well, my, my sister smokes, and I'm going to give her an e-cigarette. And he just turned into this. <laughs> it was like, all of us were like, whoa. Um, he is not professional at all. And he just sort of went, well, you kill your sister then. And it was like, wow, Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, easy to, un to get him to, you know, when in court cases and they try to get people to lose their temper and then their credibility. Yeah, he's um, easy to undermine if you just... And you would be perfect at that because, um, yeah, you'd really... Yeah, you would really get under his skin, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm getting messages that we definitely need to end this, uh, this uh, GFN TV commentary happening, so please tune in. Thank you so much for your participation today. Happy.